Jesus, precious Jesus, oh for grace to trust him never. One, one moment. Pastors, can you hear the girls leading in the singing? Yes? Are you able to sing with them? Okay, let's, let's sing some more. Very good. Let's sing some more praises to God to give him honor. Okay. Let's have one more song. Okay, and and because we, we want to make this interactive with our, our friends, let's all stand up, whether you're in your home or here. We're going to sing To God Be the Glory. <laughs> Be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us the Son. Who revealed it as I found atonement for sin. And open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Amen. We can have a seat, everybody. <clears throat> we are beginning a training that I call the call of Elijah. The call of Elijah. And uh, Mike, I'll need you just to move over just a little bit more. Your group just a tiny bit more so I can see all of our friends here. Pastors, church planters, did you bring your Bibles this morning? You got your Bibles? If you didn't get your Bible, please grab your Bibles. Students, did you bring your Bibles? Hold it up if you got your Bibles. Amen. Good, good, good. So the question this morning, as we're thinking about the call of Elijah, the call of Elijah is an interesting call because in the story of Elijah, we see that there is a man who called Israel back to Jehovah God. And we as a people need to call Israel today back to Jehovah God. Amen? But how can we call Israel back to Jehovah God, like in revival, if we're not first a disciple of Jesus? Are you with me, pastors? Are you with me there? We must be disciples of Jesus first. Now, first thing, let's all agree that we can take our phones and put them on silent. And if, you, if you're not using your Bible on them, then let's even turn them off. If you're needing them for your Bible, then you leave them on. But let's don't let our phones, pastors, church planners, students, let's don't let them be a distraction. Okay? Now, this morning, uh, how many of you pastors have somebody in the room with you? Pastors and church planters. If you have your spouse, uh, if you have some family members so you can be a team, put your thumbs up if you do. If you have somebody in the home with you, put your thumbs up. Okay? Looks like some of you do. Good. 
Can we move the screen over so I can see who else is uh, putting their thumbs up? Is that possible? Okay, I, uh, next group, if, uh, if you have somebody there with you, put your thumbs up. If you have somebody in your home with you, put your thumbs up. Okay, and uh, next screen, if we have a next screen. That's it, just two screens, very good. Okay, right now I invite you to turn in the Holy Word of God to Matthew 4. Matthew 4. In Matthew chapter 4, I'm going to give your team an assignment. Pastors and church planters, if you're by yourself, you can just use this for your own exploring time. Uh, I'm hoping, pastors and church planners, that you have somebody in your home with you, if possible. Some family member that can do this with you. Our students and faculty here definitely want you to do this exercise as a team. Please look at Matthew 4, verses 18 through 20. Matthew 4, 18 through 20. The question is, if this was the only passage of Scripture you had... What does this scripture tell you about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? If this is the only scripture you had, what does this tell you about what it means to be a disciple? So again, for our online audience, our local audience, I'm going to give you about four minutes to read the passage and explore this together. I'll give you four or five minutes. Please study it. Pastors and church planners, if you have a piece of paper, please take notes. We'll be taking answers here just in a few moments. Matthew 4, 18 to 20, what does it tell you about being a disciple? Please read it out loud with your circle. <clears throat> and I'll put a timer on my phone so I can time this time. <laughs> I'll give you four or five minutes right now. Again, pastors, as you're there in the home right now, if you can just be studying that very carefully, I'll be asking for uh, volunteers online to answer the question, what is a disciple? Uh, I'm challenging you, my friends, to not be philosophical or theoretical with your answers. We want to be very practical in how we answer the question, and please just answer with one line. We're not going to do that yet. The students are still reading right now and discussing. So please be taking notes, pastors, right now. And uh, I want very short answers, like, like just one sentence or two maximum, not, not sermons, not devotionals. And we'll give, I think we have three more minutes uh, to, to study this prayerfully and then answer. <clears throat>
Two more minutes and then we'll be taking answers. I will be starting with uh, the students and then pastors and church planners, I'll come to you next. So just if you can be getting ready. <coughs> just 90 more seconds. <laughs> Students, students, one more minute. One more minute before I'm going to get responses from you and then also the pastors and church planters. Okay, uh, I need the microphone up here and I'm going to invite first of all students uh, to come. How would you, students, how would you answer the question, what is a disciple of Jesus? If you only had these three verses to tell you, how would you respond? Okay, are you going to go first? Yeah, what is a disciple of Jesus only based on these three verses? If this is only scripture you had to give you an idea, a hint about what it means to be a disciple, what would you answer? Just give me one insight only and only about this long. Okay. Like one sentence. A disciple of Jesus is one thing. A disciple of Jesus is someone who would lay out everything just to follow his teacher. Amen. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. I just want you to fill in the blank. A disciple of Jesus is, and add to it. Students, uh, come and grab the microphone if you're willing to add to it. A disciple of Jesus is, what else? Based on these three verses only. Use your big voice for us because so we can hear. Amen. Thank you. Uh, a few more students. Let's take two more on this side and then I'm going to go to the pastors and uh, church planners. What's a disciple of Jesus? Amen. One more, students. What's a disciple of Jesus? Whatever similar words that you have, if the mic doesn't work, you can just repeat the, the answers so they can hear you. The mic doesn't work. Oh, it's not working. Oh, okay. So uh, you're not hearing the, their answers, right? Pastors, you're not hearing, right? Okay, but you can still hear me, right? You can hear me? Okay. So sorry. So. Now, uh, so we're going to work on that. Now, pastors, church planters, uh, 
if you raise your hand if you're willing to answer the question the students were answering it just like with one sentence fill in the blank a disciple of Jesus is pastors church planters how would you fill in the blank based on those three verses okay okay go ahead uh, how, how do I hear them Uh, we're not hearing you yet. Can't, can't hear you yet. One second. How can we hear them? Let's see here. How can we, how can we hear? I want to hear, I want to hear our pastor in the black with the white shirt, but how do I hear him? Okay, Pastor Ferdinand, right? Pastor Ferdinand? Okay, we're trying to get you so we can hear you. And uh, that, it's not coming on yet. Okay. We're going to do one more exercise while they're getting that because I really want to hear you pastors on this. Pastor Ferdinand, don't forget, okay, what you're about to say. Okay? So, students, students, pastors, and church planters, next part of the question. If this was the only passage you had in Scripture about who Jesus is, what would you say this teaches about Jesus? So I'm going to give you this time maybe just two or three minutes. Go back to your circles, in your homes, if you have someone to discuss this with. Ask each other, what does this tell us about who Jesus is based on just these three verses? Let's go. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody, I'm going to call you together now. We have the screen working. Okay, Pastor Ferdinand, what does this passage, first of all, tell us about what it means to be a disciple? Just please, a short answer, because then after you, I'll ask for a few more pastors, church planners. Oh, just, just one thing, okay? One thing, okay? Just one thing. Oh. Amen. Thank you very much, Pastor Ferdinand. Uh, another pastor or church planner, what, what else does it teach us about being a disciple of Jesus from this passage? Okay? Okay, raise your hand if you want to speak, and we'll go to you. You may have to switch the screen, too. Help me out, because I can't read the name of the pastor from here. Pastor Adrian? Right. Okay, go ahead, Pastor. Yes, Pastor. Um, a disciple of Jesus is anyone. Uh, is anyone? Ah, what do you think about that? Praise the Lord that it's not just for the elite, right? Right, Pastor? 
Amen. Okay, are there some church planters that would answer this question? What does it mean to be a, a disciple of Jesus? Raise your hand if you're willing to speak. Okay, right here. Pastor, which one? Or, or church planner? Oh, Pastor Israel, I can't see you. Okay, good. Go ahead, Pastor. Pastor Ron. Yes. The disciple of Jesus is the one that is bold. They left everything that they are doing and they followed him. Amen. Amen. So being a disciple of Jesus, you can't keep holding on to what you're holding on now. Something has to be dropped. Students, do you believe the Spirit of God is impressing you to drop things? Yes. I want to ask you, pastors. I like that rooster, by the way. The rooster is beautiful. <laughs> pastors, church planters. Do we, even as pastors... Even as pastors and church planters, do we have to drop something to follow Jesus? Do we? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Is there another church planter that would answer the question, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Bye. Okay, Marcus. You said Rickson? Rickson. Would you answer, please? Yes. Uh, a disciple of Jesus has a willing heart. Amen. Thank you so much. Yeah, you have a willing heart. Very good. Now, students, students, who is Jesus in this passage? Then I'm going to come back to the pastors. Who is Jesus Christ? in this passage. Now, they will not be able to hear you on the mic. Keep your answer very short because I'll have to repeat your answer back to them, okay? So, how would you answer, students? And then I'll repeat it back to the pastors. Yes, sir. Pastor, instead of, of the students or the disciples going to Jesus, he was the one looking for disciples intentionally where they are. He said, our brother here, said, our younger brother said, instead of Jesus waiting for disciples to come to him, Jesus went to where the people were. So that's something that tells him about who Jesus Christ is. Somebody on this side, what does it tell you? Right over here. Jesus is an initiator. Jesus is an initiator of his people. Amen. Right over here. Jesus is beyond what you can see right now. Just short. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Jesus is more than you can see, right? He has more plans than what you think he has for you. Someone on this side. Right here. He speaks with authority. Jesus speaks with authority and confidence, she says. One more on this side. Right here. Jesus is not after your background or your... Ah, Jesus is not like hung up on your background, right? Good. Pastors, how, what would you add to that? Based on this passage, what does it tell you, pastors and church planners, about who Jesus Christ is? Raise your hand if you're willing to speak. We can go to the other screen as well, if we need to. I'm looking, I'm not seeing any hands up yet. What does it tell you about Jesus? Can we switch the screen? Or not? Oh, right here. Oh, oh, oh well, I just lost you. Sorry. Keep raising your hand. Keep raising your hand. I think it's... Pastor... Which one? What's the name? Wilfred Tesla. Pastor Wilfred? Go ahead, please. Yes, he needs our help. Amen. What else does it tell you? Somebody else on the screen. Okay. Argelino. Okay, go ahead, Pastor. Uh, okay, hold on, sorry. One second, sorry. Okay. I think it's right, right here, right? Okay, go ahead. Yes, Pastor Art. Okay, Pastor Art. Go ahead. Jesus is a great master. Amen. Amen. Master. He said pastor? 
Master. Master. Yeah, but he's also our pastor. Jesus is our pastor, right? Yes. Our pastor and our master. Anybody on this uh, second screen? How do you say his name? Danriel. Danriel, go ahead. Ooh, he defines our purpose. Amen. 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 And what's this young man right here? James. James. James, James go ahead, please. Jesus is a disciple of himself. He's a what? Jesus is, is a disciple of himself. Oh, yes, he is. Absolutely. Jason or Rihanna? Jason. Hold on. One second. Where did Jason go? We're looking for Jason. Yes, sir. Uh, one second. Oh, he's raising hand. Uh, Roel, is it? Is that it? Roel? Ooh, amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you for this. Now, sorry, sorry, sorry. W watch out because I'm backing up. I can't always see you. Sorry, sorry. I don't want to step on your foot. Okay. Now, everybody, <clears throat> um, are we willing in this audience, live audience, and our online audience, are we willing to do a survey about being a disciple of Jesus? Are we willing? Are we willing, pastors, if for me to do a survey? And we'll have all of our heads bowed, okay? So we don't need to look. And, uh, and pastors, you can't see each other, so don't worry about this. But I'm going to ask everybody to answer with their uh, thumbs up. Let me think. No, just put your hand up if it's a yes. If it's a no, just keep your hands down. Pastors, are you understanding? I'm giving a survey. And these are discipling questions. If the answer is yes all the time, then put your hand up for this vote. Um, and if it's no, just keep your hands down. Okay, I'm going to the board right here. And I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be the only one that will be opening your eyes. By the way, everybody needs to close your eyes here because it's not anybody's business here to see how the pastors are answering. And uh, pastors, I'm going to ask you to keep your, your uh, eyes closed too because uh, we want to protect the confidentiality of the students, their vote. Okay, pastors? Well, I'll close our, our eyes. So the first question, so teachers the same way here, okay? My first question, I'm just putting this up on the board. My first question is, do you spend, at this time in your life, do you spend, uh, I mean, do you have uh, every day, do you have meaningful time alone with God in His Word? So every day, meaningful time alone with God in His Word. If it's yes, please put your hands up. Okay, so I'm counting the students first and I'll go to the screen. Okay, okay, and we're counting on the screen. Students, can you put your hands down? So how many on the screen? 29. Okay. Okay. Okay, this says, students, you can open your eyes, everybody. This is students, and this is pastors and church planters. I'm going to do CPS, okay? Now, next question is going to be about prayer. Let's all close our eyes. And pastors and church planners, please close your eyes too because, again, let's make it fair. Uh, the students would like to have their response private. And I want your response to be also be private. So students are not looking at you now. Uh, we're just doing our count. Here's a question number two. If, uh, do you have daily unrushed time? If you can close your if you have daily unrushed time in prayer, 
Do you have daily unrushed time in prayer? Raise your hand if the answer is yes. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Okay. And we're doing our final count of pastors and church planters. Keep your hands up, pastors and church planters, if this is true of you. This is only if it's daily that it's unrushed. Keep them up uh, if, you're, if the answer is yes. How many? 34. Okay, everybody can look up. So whereas we had 14 the students that said they're in the Word every day and 29 pastors, church planners, in prayer, we have 17 students among us, or, or staff, who have uh, unrushed prayer, and we have 34 pastors. So we had a little more in this one. Isn't that interesting, everybody? Okay, third question. Are you ready, everybody? You ready? Heads down. On the screen, too. Please, let's heads down, if you don't mind. So we're not looking at each other. Third question. Third question is, uh, do you have the practice that first thing in the day, you surrender all you are, all you have to Jesus as Lord. Is this your practice every day of the week? If it's yes, please raise your hand. If every day you surrender, first thing, you surrender to Jesus as Lord of all you are and all you have. Keep hands up. Okay, I have the number for our local audience. Yeah, everybody keep your heads down, please. We're not looking yet. Thirty-three, okay. Okay, our answers, everybody can look up. We have 15 on our local, <coughs> our local audience that practice daily surrender to Jesus as Lord. Of our uh, online audience, we have 33 that practice this. Now, before I go any further, I want to challenge those of us local and those online. Let's be very honest because we're not trying to impress each other. We're doing this so that we can put our fingers on our pulse. We did this with the students, some of our same audience here last night, but we have some different audience here now too. That's why we're doing it again. Pastors, I'm going to be honest with you in front of the students. Each of these discipling questions that I'm asking you, there's been times in my pastoring, unfortunately, that I would have had to say no. I have often been a pastor that's been too rushed for these very things. Every question I'm asking you is coming out of a journey that God's taken this man on in a very humbling way to make me, make me realize that I had deficiencies in my walk with Jesus. So I'm not asking these questions to be critical. I'm saying these are areas God has had to challenge me on and call me on. And we want to know where we stand so that we can pattern the training over the next few days to make it true. Okay? Okay, pastors, are we good? That's why I'm asking these questions. Thumbs up if it's good. Okay, heads bowed, everybody, online and local. Heads bowed, please. Number four question. Number four question. Every day, so seven days a week, do you ask for and receive the fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit? Every day, do you ask for and receive the fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit, just as promised in the book of Acts. Only raise your hand if you know this is the living truth in your life. Raise your hand. Keep them up, please.
Okay, are we good? 18. 18, okay, let's, let's open our eyes. Here's the results. We have 13 of our local audience who have this as your practice and experience. We have 18 uh, for our online audience. Did you notice a change all of a sudden in our results? Isn't that interesting? Do you see where the trend is going? Here? Do you see where the trend is going here? That's interesting, isn't it? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> number five. Let's heads bowed, please. Heads bowed. Online audience, let's do the same, please. We don't, we're not looking at each other's audiences, so everybody heads bowed, please. Pastors too, heads bowed. Okay, if we can close our eyes. Okay, pastors have their eyes closed and our local audience does too. So our fifth question is this. Are you free from anything in your life that would make you a slave? Are you free from anything in your life that would make you a slave? Do not answer yet, let me explain. I'm asking a very tough question. And while our heads are bowed, I'm going to say this, my own uh, quick testimony. There's been times in my life, even as a pastor, when I was not free. I can think of a time in my life when I was a slave to always having to run home. And when I was very tired, I would go to YouTube and I would try to, to laugh at something funny or, you know, whatever. And it started out very innocent, but it ended up being something what became a habit. And I, I wasted too much time on it. And so I'm just being real with you, pastors. I'm being real with the students here. Anything in our life that ends up being a habit that we go to instead of running to Jesus Christ becomes something we become a slave to. For some people, it's pornography. For some people, it's eating. You know, having to go eat and, and have a treat to eat. You know, sugar. Uh, it could be uh, fear can make us uh, a slave. And also bitterness towards fellow pastors, towards fellow students, towards administrators. That can make us a slave. Or towards someone who hurt us in the past. So now I ask the question. Are you free, right now today, are you free in your life? from anything that makes you a slave. Has Jesus Christ made you free and you know you're not a slave to anything by the grace of God? Raise your hand if you know that's true. Only raise it if you know this is actually true in your life. Okay, I'm counting everybody's eyes. Please close your eyes, pastors, too, because you don't need to see the local audience. One. Okay, local audience can put your hands down. And pastors, we're still counting. Okay, how many? You said? Okay, open your eyes, everybody. We have three in our local that said they're free by the grace of God. We have 11 out of our, our online audience. One last question. One last question. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. I gave you six questions last night, right? Seven? Oh, six. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Number, last one. Uh, please close your eyes. The last one is, how many of you are currently... You know what? Let me pause. Open your eyes. I want to do a demonstration first before this, I ask this question so that we interpret it the same way. I need one of you students to come and be my guinea pig. Do you say that in this culture or not? Guinea pig means like someone to practice with. Sorry if I said the wrong thing. Oh, okay, thank you. In, in, a, in North America, we say, I need a guinea pig. That means someone that's going to be your trial that you're going to try it out with. So sorry if that's bad here. So let's say um, a volunteer. That's better. Okay. <laughs> so I need someone. Can I borrow your red um, thing there? Your mug? Is it? It's not breakable easy, right? Okay, <clears throat> so back up just a little bit. Maybe push this just a little bit back. Okay, so that our people can see. Sorry, my back's to you. Try to come around so you can see a little bit. So imagine that this is the truth of Jesus Christ. Okay, everybody? Imagine this is the truth of Jesus Christ. Here is, I always say it right, Mike. 
Okay, thank you. Good. Here's Mike. Imagine that Mike is my next door neighbor and imagine that he is not a Christian and I want to disciple him to Jesus. Traditionally, in the Seventh-day Adventist church, we think this way. And pastors, tell me if you agree with this. I'm saying traditionally, when we think about sharing Jesus with someone, we think, oh, here's the good news of Jesus, just symbolically. And we think, hmm, he's my next door neighbor. He doesn't know Christ. What can I do? Many times we take the truth, maybe in the form of a what? A brochure, right? And we might say, Mike, hey, you're my neighbor. Good to see you this morning. Hey, here's some good news. And we give them the brochure. And then what do we do? Sometimes we think, I've got Mike covered with the good news. And then we tend to just stay here if you don't mind. I'm going to take that though. But then we tend to go like this. Oh, here's Carlo. He lives on the other side of my house. Oh, I have not shared the good news with him. Get ready. So we think, oh, uh, let me polish it up. Make sure it's ready. I have a new brochure. Oh, Carlo, here's the good news for Jesus. About Jesus. I hope you enjoy it. And then we wash our hands. And then we think, oh, my co-worker. I don't think I've ever told her about Jesus. Oh, so get ready. And so we throw the good news. We go through life as church members passing the good news, but making few disciples of Jesus Christ. Pastors, thumbs up if you agree, thumbs down if you think I am wrong, that this is our often our usual practice. I'm looking to see on your screen, thumbs up if you agree this is our usual practice, thumbs down if you disagree. Okay, next screen. Let's check on the other ones online here. Okay, looks like most agree, most agree. Now, <clears throat> okay, now everybody, now I'm going to do one more de demonstration with Mike. Making a disciple of Jesus is not just passing the truth to Mike, running, going on to Carlo, my sister, and others. It's not discipling, amen? amen. Not discipling. Discipling would look more like this. Mike, it's so good to see you. And uh, we want to invite you to come to our house to eat. And fellowship, my wife and I would love to have you and your wife. You didn't know you had a wife, but you do. <laughs> All right. And come to our house. So just grab a chair over there. Okay. And so we base, we base, he's coming back, don't worry. He's just still looking for his wife. So discipleship is based on on relationship, not just from tossing the truth to somebody and running. So it looks more like this. We sit down at the same table. We lean back. We're not rushed. And while we're chit-chatting about life and where he works and uh, how long he and his wife have been married and how many children they have, he's looking, are you happy about that? Yeah. Think, okay. <laughs> then you get to know each other. And then when the Holy Spirit tells you it's the right time, you then and only then you share the good news and say, by the way, Mike, I don't know if you know Jesus, uh, but April and I, that's my wife, April and I, we are so thankful to know Jesus, not just as a church issue, but he's our best friend. And I want to know if we could invite you and your wife and all of your children, your 10 children, to, to come to our home next week and could we, could we explore, explore together about who this Jesus Christ is. And so I'm going to invite you to, to take this Bible. I'm giving you a Bible right now. This is just symbolic. But I'm giving you a Bible because you don't have a Bible, right? No. So here, and I open it up and say, here is one place to read. And would you read this one chapter with your family and come back next week and see and tell me what you learn about Jesus from this one chapter. Now he comes back next week and my wife and I say, here's the meal. We enjoy a meal. My point is not you have to have a meal. My point is you have to have relationship with someone you're discipling. Amen? It's based on relationship. Jesus is so awesome with this. When he walked on earth, 
He didn't just say, I want to tell you one word about the good news of Jesus. I want to tell you one word. He was always making relationships with people. Amen, Pastor? Amen? So it might look like this. Uh, Mike, we've been meeting now for several weeks. You've been coming with your lovely family. And um, <clears throat> here, now, I know by now you, you know Jesus as your Savior. And uh, I want to teach you tonight about how to spend time with Jesus. So I, I challenge him to, to, to spend time with Jesus. And I ch teach him how to do it. And then I say, okay, good night. So if you can walk off the set. He goes off. And I don't see him for a week. He comes back after a week. April and I are praying for him. He and his wife and, and his many children come into our home. And then before I teach him a new lesson, students, what should I ask Mike? What did he do with the challenge? The students said I should ask Mike, what did he do with the challenge from the Word of God? Right? The object in discipling is, if you can stand up, it is not enough if you can just put that out of the way so they can come back and see. Come back all the way back so they can see. It's not enough for me as a, a disciple maker to know that Mike just has the truth in his head. Pastors, for too many years, we have only passed the truth to people in a way where we think that they know it only here. Students, where does the truth of God need to go? Into Mike's heart. But even then, sometimes, pastors, have we not, and church members, have we not even stopped there and said, well, Mike understands it. We're pretty sure that he loves Jesus. It's a, it's a heart thing. But should we stop there if we're discipling them? No. Where do we go next? Uh, into his hands. Meaning, the love of Jesus, the truth of Jesus, must go into the disciples' practice. His life practice, right? It has to affect how he lives. Are we done, students, with discipling him? Where does it need to go next? It needs to go to his feet, meaning what? Yeah, the truth is you just put it down to your foot and then just, it's got to go to his feet, and then you can bring it up again. It's got to go to his feet, and he has to go where? He has to go get somebody else. So bring somebody else up here. Bring someone else up. Just leave the things behind. Okay, and you, you come on this side. It has to all of a sudden start over again. Like until I'm discipling him to disciple someone else, I have not discipled him. And so he would need to start the same thing and just do the thing like head, heart. Like head. It's got to go, what's your first name again? Edson. Edson. It's got to go, say it with me. It's got to go from Edson's head, head to his heart. heart to his hands to his feet. What do you say? That's a different, what? Another one. Oh, a student. I'm about to have a learning moment. I love this. Okay, where else does it go? Oh, you mean it needs to go to another person. I thought she was saying it needs to go to another, like to his elbow or something. Okay. Okay, now, are you all ready for my last question? Now with that, that's my little teaching moment. Okay, everybody, pastors online, let's bow our heads. Uh, local. Let's bow our heads for the last question. Number six. With the description that I've just given you of making disciples, not just giving information to people, how many of you are currently and actively discipling someone else to know Jesus in their mind, to have Jesus in their heart, to have Jesus in the life practice and even discipling them to the point where you see them now discipling someone else. Who in this room and online is actually actively doing that with someone outside the Adventist church, not just church members, but outside the Adventist church? Okay, raise your hand. Okay, online and local, please, right now. Hold it up if, so I know if you're raising it up or not. Okay, local can close, I mean, can uh, put your hands down, but keep your eyes shut. Okay, everybody can put your, your eyes open. 
we have nine locally and how many pastor 16 here okay <clears throat> discipling discipling an unbeliever or at least someone outside of the church okay <clears throat> now now I have a tough question for you some of you participated in this last night and some not by the way students pastors the simple exercise I'm doing right now I have done in different churches around the world I've done it with different pastoral teams around the world I've done it with teaching teams I've done it with students I encourage you in the simple process I'm just teaching you if you really go into a church or a village as students or as pastors and you go to your church and you want to know what is the pulse of the people you're trying to reach in the church I'm talking about right now I would encourage you to find a way to ask these simple questions so you know what's the reality but always do it anonymously I, usually we'd have like paper except I can't do paper with my online audience but usually I would put paper you know and just do a yes or no is this a tool you can use everybody uh, pastors if you remember to ask Pastor Israel uh, to email you I have 13 discipling questions 13 questions would you like to have those pastors would you like to have those so you email your office you can get them and uh, how many of you locally would like to have 13 discipling questions that you can use to help you know about your group that you're trying to reach for Christ can you uh, remember to ask your pastors your two pastors that are here today okay locally all right amen here's my question now in your little groups and our online group with whoever you're with in your home I would like you can you zoom in on these real quick okay I would like you to look at these and our online audience you might want to take these down real quick he's zooming in right here can you if you can see okay put your thumbs up if you can see the results online okay you can see them if you just write these down real quick so uh, this is not only students but it just means our local audience and then pastors and church planners administrators if you can write these down here's my question to you both locally and abroad what uh, please pray for just a moment with your group just for one person praying per group and with the results we got both for the pastors church planners and also our local team what is the Holy Spirit saying to us about our personal condition in the last days what's God saying to our per, about our personal condition with Jesus okay I'm gonna give you about just three minutes so pray briefly discuss briefly and then we'll take answers let's go I'm putting a timer on for three minutes Pastor,
<laughs> oh, sorry, thank you. <laughs> We have one more minute, one more minute, uh, pastors, church planners, we have one more minute to prayerfully consider what is the Holy Spirit telling us about these results. Okay. Okay, everybody. If I can have your attention. Okay, and online, if I can have your attention, please. Now, everybody, remember, I don't have a microphone. <clears throat> By the way, I need you to pray for my voice because I'm not using a microphone and I, I, I'm not used to doing online. I'm projecting my voice too much. I need, and I can feel it going. <coughs> so, uh, I don't know if anybody can get me hot water, but if we can get hot water, that would be good. But it has to be boiled water. So if somebody, thank you, dads, for that. Okay, now, I want to ask the question for observations. And uh, should we start with our online or local for observations? Okay, we'll start local. So pastors, you have just a moment to, to gather your thoughts. Uh, remember in, in our observation, I want us to own it about ourselves, not pointing to it. Like, I don't want online pointing to you students and saying you should. I don't want students pointing to online and saying you should. I want us to own it, meaning like this. For instance, you remember when I, I, I talked to you about being free? I owned it by saying there's been times in my life as a pastor I have not been free. Uh, I, there's times in my life that I was, was uh, bound to bitterness. I shouldn't have been bound to it. I should have been free, but I, I held on to bitterness towards people that hurt me. So when you give your observations, I want you to be honest and own it yourself, not pointing to another group like, no, don't point to faculty here or pastors there or whatever. And same way for those online. We just, we just own it. What is God saying to us personally about our need? Here, our observation. Fair enough? Okay, uh, keep your answers very short to the local group because I have to repeat to my online friends. So just like, like phrase or sentence because I don't want to have a long thing to say back. Starting right here. Uh, the one student says he feels like it's a rebuke. The Holy Spirit is saying a rebuke to him. Okay, uh, what else? Who else? What's God saying to you, students, about the results? Yes. <coughs> if I were to own it, before I used to be a legalistic person. You have to make it really, really short. Okay, Okay, I have to repeat everything. Yes. So before, uh, he says he's been a, a, a legalistic person. Yeah, and in the end, without the Holy Spirit, I made people hate the truth rather than bring the truth. He says he's often made people hate the truth because he was so legalistic. Okay, thank you for sharing. What is God saying to you, brother? It's our spiritual journey to? To God. Okay, thank you. Any other observations? What is this telling you? Yes, ma'am. Um, for me, I think it's uh, like, personally, how can you disciple someone else if you're not doing well in the other 
Okay, this young lady over here said, uh, uh, see if I'm saying this right. She's saying, how can we disciple someone else if we're not spiritually healthy ourselves, right? That's her point. True. Uh, right over here, yes. Oh, okay, slow, slow down. Uh, state of our church is what? Oh, lukewarm. She said the state, the state of our church is lukewarm. She was saying. Okay, is there one more student before I go to our online? Yes, sir. Okay, hold on, hold on. So the student here says, I think I'm confused because I thought I was maybe uh, healthy spiritually. And uh, what? But I have no precious time to read the Bible. But he says he has no precious time to read the Bible. So thank you, students. Uh, and now let's go online. Uh, pastors, um, online audience, what, what's your observation with these kinds of results about our own spiritual health? Uh, how would you own it yourself? What does it say to you personally? Yeah, please. Oh, sorry. Put your hands up if you want to respond. We'll come to you one at a time. Who would respond, please? We're looking at both screens. Where? Oh, right here. It's Pastor John Raylan. John Raylan, please. We'll come to you first. Okay, uh, uh, it is telling me that we all fall short. Yes, we all fall short. Amen. And I saw another hand up, I think. Keep your hand up. I saw one just a few minutes ago, seconds ago. Maybe the other screen, I think. Uh, Hari Vasco. Okay. Go ahead, please. Hold on, sorry. Oh, it's so wrong. Harry, Harry, please. Harry. Yeah. Uh, the Holy Spirit is telling us, uh, telling me that uh, there's a lot of things to learn and a lot of things to do. Okay. Yes. I think it is uh, Melvin Garzon Hamora. Melvin Hamora. Melvin Hamora. Melvin Hamaro, Hamaro, are you wanting to speak? Raise your hand if you are. Did I get the right name? Yeah, Melvin. Mel Melvin? Where is he? Point to the right. Melvin. We're looking for Melvin on here. We just saw his hand. I don't know if he's raising his hand or fixing his... Uh, yeah. Okay, I guess not. Is there anybody that will respond? Anybody else? Raise your hand. We're going back and forth to both screens. Peter. Peter, would you respond, please? Okay. Uh, the Holy Spirit is telling me that I need Jesus Christ. Amen. Me too. Yes. The Amen. More that I feel that I'm sinful. Amen. Sure. Amen. Anybody else? Online? Uh, I'm going to take one or two more before we go on. Pastor uh, Andet raising his hand. Uh, Andet. Is Pastor Andet raising his hand? Raise your uh, higher if, if, you're, if you're wanting to speak. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Thumbs up if you're wanting to speak. Is he, is he wanting to speak? Nope, I guess not. Is there one, anybody else that wants to speak to this? What is this telling us this morning? I'm going to the other screen. Thumbs up if you want to speak. Okay, uh, I guess no one else has an observation. Where? Right here. Dave? Dave, Dave? okay. Go ahead. You're on? You're not, you're not uh, audio. There's no audio for you. One second, please. No audio for you. Do you have your audio turned on? No, do you have your audio turned on, brother, pastor? Everybody else we can hear, but we can't hear you. Huh. One more second. Okay. Try it again, please. Pastor? No, it's, uh, it's not on. Yeah. 
Okay, okay, sorry, uh, it's not, your audio is not coming through. Let's try one more pastor just to see, we'll do a test on the audio. Um, who else? Give me a thumbs up if you're willing to speak. What is this telling us? Up here in the corner, back. We're coming to you right now. And it's Pastor Ga Galaxy, is that right? Galaxy, yes. Galaxy, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. What is God, what is God saying to me is that I need um, constant support and properly yielding myself, properly yielding myself, but this is also. Proper, is, is, uh, so hold on one second, the audio is going in and out. Okay, is your audio okay there? Do it again. Try it again one more time. Can you hear me, Pastor? Yes. That's better. So, my reflection. So, I need a constant surrender to God. Yes. Uh, pleasing myself at His disposal. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Now, Local audience and online. <clears throat> Pardon me? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hold on one second. Hot water has come to my rescue. Thank you very much. Huh? We'll see. It's very peaceful. It's not hot, but it's, but it's much better than cold. Thank you, Dad. Okay, thank you. Now, how many of you here and online see these results and are willing to focus today and as much as we need to this week on growing first as disciples of Jesus? Not just church members, but disciples of Jesus ourselves, like in a day-by-day -day way, so that our life actually becomes contagious for Christ to non-believers. Uh, put hands up if, that's, if that is a good focus based on our results. So I'm looking here. Well, I think everybody here. <laughs> hands up if, you're, if you think that's a good focus for us. Only 14? Okay, uh, pastors, let me ask you again. We didn't get everybody. Uh, I don't know if you're answering or not. I'm asking the question. Uh, pardon me? Okay. I'm asking the question, based on our survey, is it a good investment of time to focus our time right now, immediately, on how to live personally? as a disciple of Jesus Christ so we can be contagious for people who are not disciples of Jesus Christ. Contagious for the kingdom of God. Thumbs up if you believe this would be a good focus for us based on the results. We're counting right now. Some of you are not voting so I don't know. So thumbs up if you're if this is a good focus. Okay. It's almost unanimous, I think. Right? Very good. Okay. Okay, everybody. Okay, everybody. Let's do this. <clears throat> We're going to transition just for one moment. I need one of you who is a good exercise person to come up here. I need an exercise person to come up here. <laughs> okay, pastors, we believe in good health. Please stand up in your room. We're going to have a quick exercise break to get our minds activated before we do a lesson. And Brent is going to teach us something. Please stand on our online audience. 
And whatever Brent does, now do something, you know, easy things, but they're active things that you can get us all doing. They cannot hear you, so they have to follow you. Okay, everybody, the online audience can't see, I mean, they can't hear him, but they can see him. So you need to be right in the middle so they can see you properly. Whatever he does, we're going to try to do. Let's go, pastors. Let's go, students. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, stretching, stretching, stretching. <laughs> okay, dads. Hey, dads. Hey, dads. Over, over, over. Dads, dads, over, because he's the one. Hey, dads, dads, he's the one. Over, please. <laughs> and then do one more stretch like to your, to your toes, something like that. That's a long way down for me. It's a long way down. Go, boy. Oh. Okay, let's give Brent a big hand. Thank you so much. <laughs> Online, please stay standing. Online, please stay standing. Local stand, please. Now, uh, to introduce our first topic, based on what we've discovered yet this morning, I need everybody to stand in twos. Uh, online audience, if you have a friend or family member, this would be an opportunity to, to uh, get a family member near you. The question I want you to discuss for one minute only is, what is one of the most precious appointments you've had with either a family member or a friend in your entire life? What's one of the most precious appointments that you ever had with a family member or a friend in your entire life? Okay? Discuss it in twos for one minute. The same way for online. Yeah, you stay standing and I get to rest for a moment. Excluding Jesus, I said family members or friends. Thirty more seconds, and then we will begin the next presentation. <clears throat> Okay, and time is up. Okay.
Whenever you hear that sound, I need you to please sit down and be ready. Online audience, are you ready? <clears throat> Online audience, uh, pastors, excluding Jesus, your appointment with Jesus, uh, pastors, online audience, what is one of the most precious appointments you've had in your life? Uh, does anybody have a quick, quick story, like one minute or less story of a very precious appointment? I'm asking online first. And Pastor Rex is there to see who is going to be the first pastor or church planter to respond. We're checking both screens. Uh, thumbs up if you're willing to tell a quick example of a precious appointment you had. I need to hear, see thumbs up if you're willing to share a time when you had a precious appointment. Which one? Pastor Israel. Pastor Israel. Okay. Shh. Shh. Okay. Almost ready. Okay, Pastor. Amen. Amen. Thank you. But how about, I'm asking next about appointment with somebody important in your life from family or friends apart from Jesus. Does anybody have an example of an, a very important appointment with somebody in your life? Family or friends? All right, okay. Pastor Daniel. Daniel. Ernesto. Ernesto, Ernesto. My Hey. Oh, you said especially to your wife? wife? You're a wise man, my friend. You're a very wise man to have an appointment with your wife. Oh, there she is. Whoa. Hey, let's go back to that screen. Praise the Lord. I, I want to ask the missus. I have a question for your wife. I have a question for your wife. I'm trying to see your face, but she left the screen. Oh, she's shy. Uh, uh, I was gonna ask. I was gonna ask the Mrs. Pastor. Does your Does your husband remember to have an appointment with you? Okay. What's your question, Pastor? Does Does I was asking you. Does your husband remember to have an appointment with you? Yes. Yes. Pastor. Amen. Yes. Praise the Lord. By the way, that's really important in our families that we have appointments with each other. Now, now we're going to the topic. Oh, how about you students? Have you ever had an important, important appointment with a friend or a family? Yes. Give me an example. Right here. Family worship and at the same time family meeting. Oh, this girl right here says um, family worship and family meeting is a very important appointment in the style of her home. Amen for that. On this side, give me another example of a, a very important uh, appointment you've had with a family member or a friend. Right here. Pastor. Family. family. Amen. Good. Now, we're going to discuss, if you're taking notes online, if you're taking notes, or if you're punching this in, I am going to give you a simple presentation on something to address this right here. Because, uh, Pastor Rex, what's our total number online? And I need someone to count how many we have local. Someone count. 53. Uh, we have 53 total here. And what do we have local? Okay, 34 here. Okay. Now, I think it's important that we address this issue right here for a start, right? So... <clears throat> If you go into a church, if you go into a village, if you go into your own church, if you want to use this with a small group, it's nice to have an activity first, just like we did, that gets the attention of the people. I call it a connect activity. Over the next few days, I'm going to be teaching you how to construct connect activities so that you don't just go abruptly to someone with the Word of God. But you get them thinking first, laughing first, thinking, uh, using their mind first, before you present the Word of God. Does that make sense? Pastors, you with me on that? 
a connect activity that you can use that with young or old in your churches or small groups to get them like activated first. That's the point. Uh, let's bow our heads as we begin this presentation. Dear God in heaven, we took a very serious survey this morning. We've used some time for it, but it's not wasted time. Sometimes we do not take the time to analyze our audience. And then we present things that are not even relevant. I've done that before as a pastor. Maybe my friends here on campus have done that where they prepared something for their small group but didn't take the time to figure out what the needs are of the small group. Easy to do, God. Forgive me, forgive us when we have bypassed taking the time to know our audience needs. Maybe that's one of the first things we've learned in this training this morning. Slow down. Know what God is or isn't doing in the audience of one you're discipling, the audience of a small group, or even the audience of a whole church, or even the audience of a whole village in these last days. Because some of us will have the opportunity to go to whole villages with the gospel of the kingdom of God. We must know what's going on first in the hearts of the people. God, guide us right now as we talk about the most important appointment of every day. Move our hearts right now. And God, you please send the Holy Spirit because he's, he brings the teaching of Jesus, the best teacher, to our hearts in a way that we can't as humans, and I know I can't. And so please be the teacher right now through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, let's go right now to the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis. Again, if you're putting a heading, if you're taking notes in a way where you can use this to teach somebody else, let's, uh, let's do this. Um, let's say, I'm going to go over seven principles of living as a disciple over the next few days. Seven principles of living as a disciple. Okay? And this first one I'm going to teach you is about having a covenant with God. Okay? A covenant with God. Pastor Rex, are you okay with everything? Okay. I can keep going, right? Okay. So in our Bibles, online and local, please go to the story of Enoch. Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. And please read with your small group and online with someone in your room if someone's with you. Please read verses 21 through 24. Genesis 5, 21 through 24. You're only going to have about two minutes. I want to keep this moving. So see what you can discover about Enoch in that time. Hmm. Hmm? Yeah, it's probably easier, yeah. You know what, everybody? Let's do it in twos to make it a little bit more personal. Just in twos. Please read it just in twos, okay? So it's a little more personal. On, and online uh, pastors, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you just about two minutes here. And then we'll also be taking your response. So I've got you right here, a two-minute timer. <clears throat> See what you can discover about Enoch in this passage.
one more minute, and then we'll come to you pastors uh, and church planners first. <clears throat> of living as a disciple of Jesus. Seven principles of living as a disciple of Jesus daily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whenever you hear that, if you could repeat it, please. Okay. Shh. Remember, I don't have a mic, so I need you just to listen up. Okay. Are you hearing me okay? Okay. Online, I want to go right to our online audience first on this one. And pastors, what, is, uh, what does the Word of God say to you about Enoch that touches your heart this morning? I'm just going to take two responses. Pastor Rex is looking for seeing who, someone raise your hand if you're willing to speak. <laughs> Pastor what? <laughs> Daniel, Pastor Daniel. Ernesto, Pastor Ernesto, please. Go ahead, Pastor Ernesto. Is it okay? Okay. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, Pastor. Pardon me? I'm wanting to know, okay, sh I, I'm hearing too much here, please. Uh, local audience, we can't talk really, on, it won't work. Uh, I'm asking the online audience, what does this tell you about Enoch, this passage, that touches your heart? Or Pastor Ernesto. Yes, amen. Enoch walked with God, and he's saying we must walk with God. This, what else did he say? Throughout his life. Amen. Okay, Pastor Art. Pastor Art, we're coming to you. Uh, set a good example to our family in a good relationship and walk with God daily. Yes, amen. Now let's pause everybody, both locally and here. If you want to do an interesting study, uh, do you have Spirit of Prophecy online here? No problem. Awesome. I would encourage you on your own time, d look up Enoch and see not just what you can find in Patriarchs and Prophets. That's a good beginning. But uh, look and see everything you can find on what Ellen White says about Enoch. And you'll find some amazing commentary. The Lord God inspired our messenger, Ellen White, to tell us that whatever... Enoch had with God, we can have with God today. We act like what Enoch had is too far away from us. But how do you feel to know, students and pastors, that everything Enoch had with God, you can have too? What do you think of that? Amen, pastors? Praise the Lord. Now, the sad thing to me is, and I'm going to be very, very open with you all, and I want you to be honest with yourself. Remember, uh, I'm teaching in a two-layer fashion. I'm teaching you, but I'm also giving you lots of little uh, examples and teaching strategies to help you teach others. If you're taking good notes... You can have it first for your own heart, but you can pass it on. If you're taking no notes, it'll probably go nyuk, nyuk, and gone. Are you capturing this, you guys? Yeah. Here's a, something to think about. I don't want to erase this, so I'm going to just use a little portion of the board. I need to ask our cameraman to zero in right here. For too much of my life, I have had my time with Jesus in a little tiny what? Box. 
And as a pastor even, I would safeguard my box, which is good. In other words, I would safeguard my time with Jesus. I'm going to tell you the strength and the weakness in my life, both as a pastor and just in general. See, when I was a child, I found out that it's important to have time with Jesus. My parents taught me that well. And then as I got big enough to have my own watch, and then bigger, and I got to have my own alarm clock, I thought, well, if I'm going to have consistent time with Jesus, then what do I need to do? What do you think I thought? I need to set my alarm clock with enough time to get up each morning and have time to wash my face, eat my breakfast, have my time with Jesus, and get dressed for school and out the door. Practical way of thinking. The only problem is, as I went into, as old as you are as students in university, and then I went out and became a young pastor and went into the field, this little box became stronger and stronger in the walls of that box. The good thing was that it became a good habit. Are you tracking with me? Like in other words, like it was, there was almost never a day when I wouldn't spend time with Jesus in the Word and in prayer. That's the good news. Bad news is that this box, who was in charge of my time with Jesus, do you think? I was in charge of my time with Jesus. I was in charge of how much time I spent in the Word, how much time I prayed. Do you think that's good or bad? Do you think it's dangerous if we're in charge of that time? So one day, something happened. And for those of you who have my new book, you know the story. And pastors, some of you, uh, well, I don't think any of you have this book, but pastors, um, remember to ask your president. I am willing to send my new book to you. I guess online will be the best way. It's called Live Like Elijah. Live like Elijah. Mark that down on something. Ask Pastor Israel about it. Uh, I will try even today to uh, get a way to email a copy to Pastor Israel. Pastors, how many of you would be interested in an online copy of my new book? It's only about 10 days old. Off the press. We can get you an online copy. Would you like that or not? Would you use it if I sent it to you? Okay, we'll try to do that. So anyway, in that, here's a, here's a quick, quick, quick story. When I, was, when I was about eight years ago, I was in Jakarta. And in Jakarta, I was calling people to come and pray with me on top of the roof before I was speaking for the General Conference had invited me to speak to four divisions of the World Church for children's ministry and youth professionals. And every morning before I would speak, uh, for the first few mornings, I invited the delegates to come and meet me on the roof. Not all of them, just the ones I was training with early before the main meetings began. I was just barely learning about praying for the Holy Spirit then, eight years ago. I wish I could look the pastors in the eye and say that for all my life I had been praying for the Holy Spirit, but I have not done that, unfortunately. So just maybe about eight years ago, I, I just really started just barely learning about praying for this gift. So onto the roof on that one morning came about maybe 20 or 30 people on the 34th floor, at least, maybe 40th floor, overlooking Jakarta, Indonesia. As I called the people to pray, I was praying my nice, tidy prayer, my kind of prayer that I pray as being someone from a free part of the world such as you are yourselves. You know what I'm saying? where it's kind of like a nice little routine. It's a nice prayer. We're, we're sharing our heart with God, but it's a routine. I had no idea that God was about to teach me a big lesson about being more hungry for Jesus Christ. I'm going like this. I'm praying on the rooftop. There's gravel all over the top of the roof. You ever been on, on that kind of roof? And all of a sudden as I'm praying, I hear something. And I don't want to open my eyes and be rude, but I hear something. Somebody's weeping. And I look over there, and here is this, this woman from communist China weeping before God, crying. She's got her hands lifted up to God. And she's praying with an intensity that I do not have. Now, I want to ask you students something. Would you like to have a prayer life like Enoch? 
pastors, do you want to have a prayer life like Enoch that is full of the life of God? Or do you want to have a passive prayer life? So I, I wondered, what's the problem? Why is she weeping before God? On the next morning, I noticed the same thing. Except sometimes I saw other believers from communist China. They had their hands lifted up to God like they were reaching for something. I was not sure what. Finally, after about the fourth day, it was the Sabbath day, I gathered my courage, I got my translator, and I went up to that little, short, precious Chinese woman. I know some of you are thinking, that's not short, Pastor Don, that's tall. <laughs> but anyway, for me it was short. Precious, precious lady, about this short. And I said to the translator, I said, my dear sister, I said, I hope you don't mind me asking, but when you pray to God every day, you don't pray like I pray. I pray very nice prayer, very calm, very da-da-da-da-da-da, like this. I share my shopping list with God. Are you with me? Pastors, do you ever share your shopping list with God, but there's no passion in it anymore? Well, that's the way I was praying. I said, why are you praying differently? She said, last Sabbath, we were raided by the secret police. My husband is an elder in the church. She said, we don't have a pastor, but the elder's a pastor, like a pastor. And, and we have a Buddhist man who's, who's just down the street. He's angry with our church, and he turned us in. The secret police crashed to the door right in the middle of our little worship service, house church, and told us, you must not meet again. If you meet again, we will drag away your, your elder, your pastor, and if any of the rest of you church members are here, you're in trouble too. And we'll put your, your elder, your speaker, in prison. Oh, I said to her, I know why you are reaching up to sky and praying. I know why you're praying with such passion. You must be praying because you're, you're afraid for what's happening to your church. You are, must be praying with all the passion in your heart for your husband. Oh, pastor, she looked at me sadly. As if she was sad not at the situation, she was sad for me. That I did not understand the way she prayed. I said, no, what, what's wrong? She, I said, will anyone come here on this Sabbath day? Because it was, it was the time when they were supposed to be raided again. Remember, they said, don't show up. And I said, do you think that your husband will actually be there today? Oh, yes, he'll be there. Just like that, very matter-of-factly. Oh yeah, he'll show up. You mean he'll come even when they said that they will drag him away to prison? Oh yes, he will come. Really? I said, will your children be there? She said, most of us have only one child. And you know that policy. But she said, my husband and I have two. And I said, what about the church members? Will they show up? Some will not. They'll be too afraid. But she said, honestly, most will be there. It's because it's the Sabbath day and because it's the Lord's day. It's our appointment with Jesus Christ. Oh, now I know. You're weeping because you know your husband will be taken to prison and you're scared to death about your husband being taken to prison. She became even more sad, tears in her eyes. And through the translator, Pastor, you are not understanding the why I pray the way I pray. Well, sister, tell me then. I don't understand. I'm trying to understand as a free person living in a free country. And finally, with tears, she said, Pastor, I am not praying most of all for the safety of my husband. I am not praying most of all for the safety of my children or my church. No, Pastor. I am crying out to God every morning on this rooftop, pleading with him, putting my knees right in the gravel on the rooftop, lifting my hands up to God and saying, God, when my husband is dragged off to the prison, keep him faithful to you, even to the end. Furthermore, she said, I'm praying up to God and saying, when my little children watch daddy being dragged away to the prison, and they wonder, God, where are you when daddy's going away? And we're asking you, God, to help save daddy. And when daddy is not saved from the bad thing that happens, she says, I'm praying and saying, God, help my children to still believe in you.
You see, the issue she was praying about is the faithfulness of her family, not the safety of her family. Do you see a difference? Pastors, do you see a difference? Do you see a difference? And so I felt about this small. I realized my prayer life was in a tidy little tiny box. My whole experience with Jesus, I felt, was rather surface. And I want to ask you, when you hear that story, does it make you feel small in your walk with Jesus? That's the way it made me feel. So I did my rest of my training that day. But when I went up to lay my head down that night at, at, for sleep, I first got on my knees and I said, God, have mercy on me as a pastor. I've walked with you as best I know how for all my life, but I have you in a tiny little box and I'm doing all my busy things all around it. I've got my church time. I've got my family time. I've got my exercise. I've got my whatever, you know, all my things I've got to do. But I have you in a tiny little box. God, how do I get my walk with you out of the box? How many of you locally want to have God take you out of your little box with Jesus? Are you hungry for that? Yes. Me too. Pastors, are you hungry for that? So, as I was praying, the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit brought me back to a text that I had heard about, but I had never practiced in my life. I'm going to ask our online team, our local team, to go to Isaiah 50, verse 4. Some of you have already read it, but I'm going to ask you to read it as if you've never read it before. Pastors, we know this text, but often we don't live it. I invite you to read this passage, and I invite you to answer two questions. So please, somebody in your group, write these questions down. Are you ready? Online, are you ready? Please write these questions down. I'm going to be uh, asking for your input online and local just in a moment. First question. Don't answer me just now. I'm just saying these are your discussion questions. Number one. Who is the speaker in Isaiah 50 verse 4? Who is the one giving the testimony? Is it Isaiah? Is it God the Father? Is it some prophet? Who is the one speaking? Number two. Question number two. Number two is in uh, chapter 50, verse 4 of Isaiah, what is the secret? Is there a secret in there for spending time with God that is beyond the box? Time with God according to someone else's agenda, not your agenda. Is there a secret to being on God's agenda for your time with God instead of your time zone? If, you're, if my questions are understandable, please put your thumbs up online. I want you to know if we're together. Okay, some are giving me thumbs up, some I can't see. Are we good? That's not clear. Let me try it again. Oh, you, can't, you can't hear? Okay. So, repeating again, please go to Isaiah 50, verse 4. First question, please study who is uh, the one giving this testimony in Isaiah 50, verse 4. Is it the prophet Isaiah? Is it some other prophet? Who is it that's saying this verse, saying this testimony of Isaiah 50, verse 4? Number two question, number two question is, is there a secret somewhere in this verse a secret of how to spend time with God, not according to our box, but according to the agenda of God. There's your questions. Are we clear now online? Are we clear? Thumbs up if you're clear. It looks like we're better. Good. Okay. I'm going to give you just two or three minutes. Let's go. Local, you can be in teams of four, no problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I'm going to give us two or three minutes, those of us online, two or three minutes. So to our pastors and church planners, just see what you can discover. This is a passage that often we as pastors and church planters uh, probably have uh, heard much about, but the question is, what does it mean to us personally? So I'll come, I'll, I'll come and ask that question just in a few moments, a couple minutes. <clears throat> We have about 45 seconds. I'll be asking all of you online uh, after I talk to the students. <coughs> 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 Just a half a minute more, everybody. Okay, our time is now up. If, so, if you can hear me, clap twice. Now, if you're still talking, uh, then have everybody else in your group just smile at you. Shh, okay. Now, my friends, if I can have your attention, please. If when I call for you to, to come back, if you can just stop right away. I'm doing short exercise times because I want our online audience to be able to connect with us. They don't have the benefit of being in your groups, so we keep things moving, okay? So, are we doing all right, local team? Are we doing all right? Are we staying awake? Okay, pastors, are we awake? Are we okay, pastors? Thumbs up if you're okay. Okay, a lot of you are giving me thumbs up. Some of you are just looking at me, so I don't know if you're okay or not. I hope you're okay. There you go. Good, good. Praise the Lord. Now, my friends, I want to start out with the students. Please give me only like, like a sentence, like short, because I have to repeat everything back. So first question is, look with me at verse 4. Who is the author of the testimony in verse 4? The Messiah, they say. The Messiah. Isaiah. Oh, Isaiah. Oh, you're saying Isaiah. Hmm, they're saying Isaiah says it. That's an interesting one. That's an option. Is there another option of who could be speaking in verse 4? The Messiah. So, so some say it's Isaiah. Some say it's the Messiah. Now, pastors, would you please break the tie? Because some of us here say it's Isaiah speaking. 
Some say it's the Messiah speaking in verse 4. So now I go over to the screen. If you're willing to answer that question, please put your thumb up. Who would speak? We got one right here. What's his name? Pastor Ernesto. Pastor Ernesto. Uh, okay, everybody local. Shh. Please. Shh. Okay, Pastor Ernesto, please. What's the answer? The Messiah. The Messiah. Ah. Oh. What can you tell the students? Can you tell the students why? Tell us not just from your, your opinion, but is there a hint in that chapter that would lead you to that conclusion? Is there something specific in the following verses that would show us this Messiah that's, that's talking? What is it in the rest of the chapter that shows you that it's the testimony of the Messiah? And pastors online, please be looking in your Bibles. Local team, look. Is there something specific in this chapter that would, would you think might be the reason why Pastor Ernesto is saying it's the Messiah, not Isaiah? So don't answer me yet. Just look in the Word of God. See if you can find it while well, he's getting ready to answer for us. <clears throat> Pastor, do you have it? Pastor Ernesto, did you find something? Yes, according to the verse five and six. Verses 5 and 6. Okay, would you go ahead and read that for us, please? The Lord God had opened my ear and he must have forgiven us. He was returning back. I gave my heart to the speaker and I took the Lord that 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 I took the Lord Yes, it's talking about Jesus during uh, his suffering, right? Right? Uh, online pastors, if you agree with that insight that it's the Messiah, thumbs up. Okay, disagree, thumbs down. Looks like thumbs up if you agree. Second screen. Okay, very good. Are we together, everybody? Now, isn't that special that actually this is uh, about the Messiah? So, who woke up the Messiah every single day? God the Father, because right? Which, by the way, depending on your translation, when it says the Lord God, it's talking about, like we many times interpret Yahweh. Like it's, it's, it's God the Father. Okay? Now, who knows the secret, though? That's the second question. Who knows the secret to having your time with God, not your agenda, but God's agenda as far as time? I'm asking uh, right now, locally, oh, do you see a secret in there somewhere? If you do, give me a short answer. Raise your hand, and I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it back for our online audience. Right here. Okay, you use specific people. So like who, when you say he, who's he? So, okay, so God wakes us up every morning. What are you basing that on in the text? It's in verse 4, the second. It's in verse 4 when he says, he waketh, he waketh morning by morning. He awakens us morning by morning. That's the first part of the secret is that the Messiah is saying that God, the Father, wakes up the Messiah how often? Morning. morning by morning. That means every morning. Amen? Pastors, amen to that? Now, next question. Is there another part of the secret? Because it's one thing to have God wake you up, but look, would someone speak to the last part of this text? There's a, the rest of the secret is still in verse 4. Someone else. Okay, I'm going to go online. Online. Pastors, is there another part of the secret of spending time with God where it's, you're on his agenda, not your own agenda? Look at the last part of verse 4. Would one of you speak to the last part of verse 4? 
I'm looking at both screens. I don't see any thumbs up. Thumbs up if someone would speak. Let's check the other screen, please. Oh, oh here, right here we have one, right here. Pastor, what's the name? Pastor Atta? Art. Art. Art Bellarmino. Art what? Bellarmino. Bellarino. Okay, go ahead, brother. You're on. Go ahead, Pastor. Uh, no, no audio yet on you. It's not, it's not.